a few months ago, a student walked into my office uh, to discuss a seminar paper she was working on. And she shared the following. Her family's from the Cote d'Ivoire. And she still remembers so vividly a time when she was a child and she heard her mother on the phone. <coughs> Extreme distress filled her mother's voice. And the child could tell there was something of indescribable terror that had taken place in her home country. Now, she had heard about terrorism and the deaths inflicted indiscriminately, the palpable fear that was felt, and the adults around her, so far from loved ones in the Cote d'Ivoire, just emanated anguish at what had taken place, fear for the safety of others, unable to do anything about it. Years later, she was a graduate student in law, conducting research for a paper when she came across what must have happened. Confused, she called her mother, who confirmed, yes, that is what overturned our world then. That is the catastrophe that had us so fretful and sick with worry. It was the dumping of toxic waste. In 2006, a ship called the Probo Koala, while in port in Abidjan, transferred over half a million liters of toxic waste to an Ivarian contractor who then dumped the substance in over a dozen sites around Abidjan. <coughs> As a 2018 update by Amnesty International has described it, the smell engulfed Abidjan. The days and weeks that followed the dumping, thousands of people streamed into the medical facilities of the city complaining of nausea, headaches, breathing difficulties, stinging eyes, and burning skin. By the end of that year, more than 100,000 people had been treated according to official records. And officials reported that 15 to 17 people had died. And these dump sites required extensive cleanup and decontamination. That took place in 2006. Just last month, in the Amnesty International report, they state, to this day, people in Abidjan live in fear of the long-term impacts of the dumping on their health and the health of their children. So this is just one example of the larger picture of health and the environment, uh, the environmental impacts of toxics that play out in the world. Here's another. This one involves a Paraguayan doctor who's best known for, together with his daughter, bringing a landmark lawsuit in the U.S. against the man who tortured his 17-year-old son to death. This was during the Strasner dictatorship. <coughs> the police even brought his daughter in to view the body and go back to the father to carry the message to stop his political activities. Well, they made it out of Paraguay to the U.S., and they, where they eventually brought this landmark lawsuit when they learned the torturer was walking around scot-free in New York. So I tell this story to place in context what comes next. Now, Dr. Ferlardiga is back home in Paraguay practicing medicine, and he began to observe with alarm some of the health problems that he was treating, skin lesions, rashes, headaches, nausea, vomiting, birth defects, including soaring numbers of cases of children born with a cleft lip. <clears throat> he came to connect these to agrochemicals being used on the nearby soybean plantations, in particular the herbicide glyphosate. At an event marking the anniversary of the, breath of the path-breaking lawsuit that he brought, he stated the following. <clears throat> Torture is the highest sin. It is an eternal and horrendous crime. We feel it in our spirits as if it were today. We live it every moment. We are living with it each moment. Right now, he said, there are indirect ways of torture. Thousands of workers are dying in my country, poisoned by agrotoxics that are being used in different ways. We have a sick country miserable because the improper cultivation of soy has devastated our forests. <clears throat> Paraguay was once an earthly paradise. Today, there are no more forests. Because there are no more forests, there's no more rain. 
The climate has changed completely, he continued. Not only were Paraguayans tortured, now our Paraguayan land is being tortured right at this moment. We're the fourth producer of soy in the world. What a pity. We don't have birds, we don't have water, we don't have good health, our workers don't have any more land. This is a problem of massive proportions my country is struggling with now. When the father of a boy who was tortured to death by police describes a situation of torture, it carries a special resonance. So many human rights are implicated when it comes to toxics. And the link between human rights, the environment, and health is now re well recognized by international human rights bodies. A particularly important one for this film <coughs> was established in 1995 by the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. It's an expert position called a special rapporteur. Uh, it was created to address the illicit dumping of toxic wastes that have an adverse effect on the enjoyment of human rights. That was established in 1995, and the focus for all those years was illicit dumping. Then in 2011, the UN Human Rights Council decided to strengthen the mandate so as to cover not only the movement and dumping of hazardous uh, substances, but a whole life cycle of hazardous products from their manufacturing to their final disposal, which of course implicates hazards in the electronics industry. <clears throat> the following year, in 2012, the Human Rights Council extended the mandate yet further to include the issue of protecting environmental human rights defenders because those who are advocating the environmentally sound management of hazardous substances were being increasingly subjected to harassment, arbitrary detention, and even killing. So the Special Rapporteur's role includes a number of things. One is providing information on human rights issues raised by transnational corporations and other business enterprises in connection with toxins. <coughs> it also involves the human rights implications of waste recycling programs. He also looks at the transfer of polluting industries and technologies from one country to another, as well as uh, current trends such as e-waste. So he also issues annual reports. So just one example, a couple of years ago, his report focused on the right to information on hazardous substances and waste. Now the right to information is actually built into, it's written into the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Article 19 proclaims the right to freedom of, of expression and access to information, and it's a key right when it comes to environmental activism. He also conducts country visits, usually just one a year. So in 2016, he conducted a country visit to South Korea, and his report includes some breathtaking statements. For example, that the International Labor Organization estimates that nearly two million workers die annually from occupational diseases linked to hazardous substances. He says during his mission to South Korea, the situation of former workers in the electronics industry was brought to his attention, including 150 former workers of Samsung Electronics who fought for over a decade to realize their right to a remedy for the diseases they developed from using toxic chemicals in the manufacture of electronic devices. And he pointed out that many of these former workers were young women. He said they should have been of good health, but they contracted cancers and other diseases within a few years of working at Samsung Electronics. Some of the victims were children whose mothers were pregnant while working at Samsung. And he noted some positive steps, for example, the creation by Samsung of an ombudsman committee. <coughs> but he emphasized there's a continuing problem of workers in the supply chains of electronics who fall victim to the toxic working conditions in the electronics industry. In addition to uh, positives and that continuing issue that he addressed, he felt he needed to also mention in his report which is posted on the UN website for all to see. He said, neither Samsung Electronics nor the government of the Republic of Korea demonstrated 
that working conditions were safe. They did not demonstrate that working conditions did not kill or injure over 120 victims that Samsung Electronics had compensated. And he saw fit to point this out to counter claims that were then popping up in the media, some say perhaps placed in the media, uh, to try and paint a rosier picture. So this is just one example of work being done in the international human rights arena to raise awareness of problems in the international electronics industry relating to workers' rights, health, and the environment. And the film we're about to see is really drawing needed attention to these issues. And if you haven't taken a look at their website, uh, I urge you to do so because it also lists action that we can take. We're, we're all into reporting and so forth, but all of the rest, we're really into action. And it has some very good uh, recommendations for action as well. So I thank KDOCS for arranging this viewing. Thank you so much, Stephanie. On behalf of KDOCS, don't run away, don't run away, don't run away.